Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Carl Brown. I'm Associate Director of Applied Technology at the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and joining me on this panel is uh, Seema Patel, who's advisor to USAID's Office of Science and Technology, and Karim C., who's the founder of Joka Lab, which is a social change hub in West Africa. And they've, they've already been on stage, and that's my first time here. So, <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking about questions of scaling and sustaining uh, innovations. Um, and so I just wanted to start with uh, Seema and have her tell us a little bit about the work that USAID is doing around uh, ideation to innovation and then hear from uh, Karim a little bit about uh, the, the lab and then I'll share some thoughts and then we're just going to kind of have a discussion up here on stage. So go for it. So really quick, the inspiration I think that's really hit USAID as a donor organization has been the transformative power of science, technology, and innovation. You know, the story of the Green Revolution is heard constantly in the halls, and I think there are um, a number of champions looking at ways to how do we source, catalyze, engage um, innovators in coming up with the next big idea that can solve big problems at scale. And you know, traditionally, USAID's programming, as most development donors, has been very project-oriented and very you know, about building institutions, and they take long years. And we forget to bet on those innovations and those innovators that can make really transformative change if only they got the support that they, they needed in those early stages. And so the Office of Science and Technology that I advise, which is a fairly new office at USAID, um, has a mandate, really, to promote scientific uh, inquiry and engagement between developing country innovators and developed country innovators. So um, USAID doesn't usually spend money in the United States of America on direct grantees, but we're doing that in these programs. And really we're looking at new ways that the agency can finance innovation. You know, the big approach, the traditional approach of big contracts with, that are difficult to apply for don't really capture these non-traditional actors. And if we're going to engage scientists, entrepreneurs, you know, university students, we've got to give them an entry point that's simple, that allows new breakthrough ideas to get through despite someone not knowing how to fill out long bureaucratic forms. And so it really is a process of reform for the agency. It's also um, processes of collaboration. So a lot of the programs, if I could just give a quick second of a few of them, is um, done in partnership with other donors, both government donors and foundations. And what we're designing is basically grant competitions, prize competitions, um, you know, grand challenges, programs where we can uh, easily call out to innovators in a very open innovation approach and find and finance some of the most breakthrough ideas around particular problem sets. So some of you in this room may have heard about the saving lives at birth, which is addressing healthcare challenges for child and maternal health. And we're looking for innovations that can improve demand for healthcare services, bring new technologies into the clinic setting in low resources places, and that can really start to stimulate communication and behavior change. And those that's done in partnership with Gates and Melinda Foundation. And there's, there's a collaboration both in the funder perspective, but also in the way that we're sourcing those innovators. We're providing them with small grants to seed their ideas, trying to play a role where the traditional market investor in investments are not going to, in order to promote them. Um, in addition to that, we're also forming relationships with universities in the US and in the developing world to try to promote development labs where, where innovators from both the academic sector and some of their consortium partners can come together to find uh, new technologies for our development issues as well. So these are experimental, but it's, it's, it's really around the idea that we can't solve these problems if we just stick with traditional development um, you know, practitioners mm -hmm. and that we really need to start finding skills, knowledge, and ideas from around the world, and the way to do it is to make it simpler for them to access that early stage financing. Yeah. So, Kareem, can you, uh, can you talk a little bit about um, how, how does a, a lab like yours, a social innovation hub like yours, help these early stage entrepreneurs in bringing their ideas to market? Okay, first, our approach is to be uh, by entrepreneur, for entrepreneur, with entrepreneur. So, uh, uh, everybody, is an entrepreneur in a way. That, so it's peer-to-peer -peer exchange uh, more than uh, consulting or this. It, it, if we have people who engage, it will be more for really specific things. Like we have a financial guy who will come in for a specific 
problem or legal advisor or things like that. Um, so first we, we, we create the infrastructure so they can come and work there with uh, everything like a company uh, so they can start. And the, but the thing is we believe that nowadays it's, it's a matter of identification of talent and creative talent actually and it's, it's, it's mainly individual who can express the, the, their talent and, uh, and the organization are not used to, to uh, engage for one individual. They are seeking for, oh, they come, they say, okay, what is your organization, what are you doing, uh, what is your revenue and how many people you have an employee. I mean, uh, in, in no, and now for the innovation process you can have people are like four to five and do things around the world mm -hmm. and uh, work in, in networks. So, the, the, so you don't have the good lens to, to find uh, those things uh, coming to. We, we don't, as we say, we create, we try to create the environment. So we support some uh, communities. Uh, we, we try to push people through events to meet each other and cross fertilization. And uh, also we have some other project we, we want to engage people together. But the thing is, when you come to innovation, uh, I believe that you need three thirds of chaos and one third of organization. So, you, you, so then, I mean, we like really open. I mean, not, uh, uh, so, someone asked me the question, what is your usual day? And I say, well, I don't know, because every day is a new one. And every day I have a new thing and people coming in. So we also follow the flow. And so for innovation, it's all, we, sometimes we say it's like surfing. You need to, to, f to get the, the good uh, wave. So it's, it, we are acting like that in the, the lab, actually. We are following the wave. You know, people can come and get an idea. And, then we, we, and it's, it's really interesting because like we get someone who are working on the um, digital uh, books. Uh, in our lab, and uh, we organize an event for our Google on Android, and then he discovered the, the tablet, and then he start uh, to adapt for the tablet, and now he's selling on, on Amazon, and also he, he, he make a, a process with Samsung to, to develop uh, some, some product for that. So uh, that, that's unusual, you know, cross fertilization then you find some innovative thing uh, as time. So I, I just wanted to, to give a couple of thoughts and reflect upon the, one of the words, which is scale. And, and I think for me, scale is kind of a tricky word because it carries within it this notion of kind of replicating something that exists and, and just making it bigger. But in reality, I think scaling a social innovation actually requires kind of radical transformation of, of any original idea or invention uh, of the technology of the business model and of the, um, even the staffing uh, around it. Um, and then just a, a second thought is really around uh, openness. And I, I would argue that openness is critical in this space to your potential for scaling something because um, if you are not open, if you're taking a proprietary approach, then the, ba the barrier to scale becomes your own organization and just what your organization can do. Whereas if you take an open approach, then other organizations can take what you've done and they can actually build on top of it um, while uh, allowing you to spread in many more places. So the one, one organization we've worked with is called OpenMRS um, and they're now in about 50, 60, 70 countries. Um, but they don't run all of those projects and because it's open source, they're allowed, that it allows them to do that. Um, so, it's, it's been said that there are more pilots in Africa than in the U.S. Air Force. So, my question is, <laughs> why, um, why do we have so many pilots and why do, they, why do most of them fail? I guess. So, you know, I think it, it is an extremely tough question and when Carl said he was going to ask it, I said, really? You're going to start there? <laughs> Um, the exactly. But I, and I, who's to blame? Yeah, don't look at me. <laughs> I, I mean, Donors? I think there are lessons. I, there are absolutely lessons about, you know, it, what, we, what in, innovators can do in the early stages to be able to get their pilot to be more effective when they do go on the ground. You know, this whole world of user-centric design and these processes that are being put in place by wonderful organizations like IDEO and Frog, and I just came across mm -hmm. one in India, Innovation Alchemy, yep. where it allows you to know way you know up front before you go into prototyping or even t developing the technology understanding user behavior mm -hmm. and user needs and integrating that into your r d process or your you know early stage um 
you know, fail and succeed process. But I do think that there, so I think there's opportunity there to make the pilots more effective from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Knowing that there's demand, you know, it's one thing I think, to, especially for the technologies that are coming from outside and maybe not, not necessarily as much as the grassroots where users have much more experience with the problems they're trying to solve. But, you know, I, there is this, this assumption, I think, in a lot of pilots that, of course, the base of the pyramid will want this technology without really thinking about what is the, those consumers' desire for that, te for that technology and what mm -hmm. is really their demand for it. Mm -hmm. And if there isn't one, making sure that you're being holistic about your approach to build in the demand creation mm -hmm. as well. And sometimes we're just financing the wrong things. You know, mm -hmm. I think especially donors can be mm -hmm. guilty of that, that we don't have that market you know, signals to know when something is not a success, and so you get behind lots of pilots, not really knowing which one is actually viable. I think, in the market. yeah, I wrote, I wrote down fail fast versus fail slow, and actually maybe many things fail too slowly. But perhaps on, on failure, uh, two things. If it's open, also the good thing is, even if, if the original project fail, perhaps you can start another project, because you can keep from, from that and perhaps use it from something else. Second idea is, I mean, if you, if you want to be involved in innovation, don't be scared about uh, failure. <laughs> uh, don't go uh, in, in, that, in that road. I mean, uh, innovation is 90% is of failure, and then you have 10% of finding something. So, I mean, but uh, donors don't like failure, actually. So I don't know how you want to invest <laughs> yeah, in innovation. No, it's difficult. Innovation. Financing comes with yeah. all kinds of strings with donors. But th this is why there are these new programs, I think, to try to change a bit of that risk profile. They're early yeah. stage, but I think that's the that's the objective, is to allow for failure. And to well, and I, I think that's also a very important role of donors is to take risks and to be willing to fail. So actually at, at the Rockefeller Foundation, we, we look at our portfolio in terms of risk uh, across the portfolio and we try to manage that, but we do want to do risky things and we do expect that some of them will fail. Um, so we're running out of time here. I just want to throw out one last question and it's about sort of the enabling environment of, of innovation. And so I think this is an area where historically the, the Rockefeller Foundation and USAID have been quite good at uh, building up institutions, building up uh, human capacity, um, helping uh, make uh, uh, markets um, and um, uh, uh, technologies like, uh, you know, uh, new plant breeds, for example, in the Green Revolution go to scale. But going forward, you know, I, I think we've agreed that, that donors and, 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 and governments can fund sort of early stage innovations, but what can we do more in terms of setting up the enabling environment for innovation? I mean, we have the social labs like, like, like what Kareem has, but what are other ideas that are happening and, and what, what more can we do to help that enabling environment? I think there's, I mean, I think that's the, the social labs, the incubators, the accelerators, the hubs, whatever you want to call them, I think are, are a very powerful institution because it does convene all that creative talent in a way and, and builds and provides an entry point to provide capacity, whether it's business skills or tech skills. Um, but often I find that they struggle with operating costs. You know, there are a lot of donors willing to fund the entrepreneur that they support, but maybe not oh. the lights and the, um, you know, the janitors and, and operating costs. And I think that's right. a great place where donors can play. But I think there's a lot more that can be done really in fostering a, an ecosystem and collaboration between local governments and the innovation communities in sense of looking at what are the policies, what are the tax issues, what are the things that our traditional partner in development, which are central governments or municipal governments, can do to inspire and build a culture of innovation and, mm -hmm. and really become um, you know, a supporter of it. You look at things that have been done in Colorado and in Boulder, and, and you know, these are policies that are meant to fun, fun, you know, support the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of that can be done internationally if, if donors are a bit smarter about how to use their traditional partners in, as part of the solution. Well, she has said everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I guess the one, one final thought I had is just around sort of market mechanisms, and we, we were talking about this over lunch, that, that there, there are not uh, the strict market mechanisms that we have with traditional uh, for-profit companies that are sort of, you know, will brutally weed out uh, systems which are not uh, succeeding. And so you end up with lots of pilots, but lots of pilots that sort of linger on. And, and, um, but it's sort of an interesting challenge because uh, the, the sorts of things we're funding are often, social, are often public goods. And so there's also market failures in production of public goods. So I'm not sure how we could get the best of both worlds in terms of being able to create a public good, but also having a market mechanism that allows you to weed out uh, innovations which aren't going to go anywhere. But. 
I mean, I think there's more cre creative hybrid models coming out of the solutions themselves, you know, the business models that are a hybrid between providing a public good but doing it in a market approach or using a market approach to, you know, to, to really spur the creation of something that is market oriented but that serves social needs. I, I think that there's a lot of gray zone between our traditional for-profit for and non-profit. Right. And so I think that that's, that's, that's really promising. But you know, just in the programs and the way the funders, I think, are, are trying to get better about trying to, about trying to mimic market incentives and looking at how they can, in their risk calculation and in their return calculation, act more like an investor would to make sure that when we're judging proposals and we're selecting groups to, to fund and to invest in, that we're doing it with a mind towards what is the sustainability in their model, you know, what is the likelihood that they're going to be able to reach a result. And in some cases, and these are the next stage, I think, of really great financing models coming out of the donor community is results-based financing, mm -hmm. where you really give the money once, the, once a market value has been hit. So sure. Haiti Mobile Money is a prize that was run by Gates and USAID, and you know, they're, they're, the jury's still out about whether this was effective and what corners were cut. But they essentially said, we won't give anybody money. We won't give a grant out. We're not going to give anybody money until they can hit this number of customers. Yeah. So they let the market tell them yeah. what, where to fund and where yeah. to finance. So it's an innovative way to think about. I, I think social okay. impact bonds is another example of exactly. that sort of new innovative financing mechanism that, that addresses this idea. Any last thoughts? Yes, we know you need to be careful because, I mean, um, there is new behavior in the, in the customer approach. They, they want more personalized things. And uh, so there is no one size fits for all. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if you take Africa, people say, oh, okay, you have done this in, uh, in Nigeria and Kenya, let's do it in Senegal or whatever. I mean, it's, it's 45, uh, 44 country, 54 countries, sorry. And uh, it's totally different. Mm -hmm. So uh, how you do it, and even worldwide, you know, uh, even like, Vodafone, they, they, they make a big uh, launch of their uh, new network uh, worldwide. And then uh, in Japan, they, they're like losing, uh, they, have, they have lost like something 50% of their customer. Mm. Because in Japan, they were uh, more advanced in the mobile system. So, I mean, we need to stop thinking like, okay, we have done it, this it's working, so let's go global. Uh, yeah. Yes, but in the meantime, adapt. You know, the user are not the same, so the user experience will not be the same. They are not reacting the same. So, uh, I mean, so include it. So take time to adapt also. Okay. Yeah. okay well, that's that's our time. So uh, I want to thank. You. Let's give a hand. So then, how you for our panel? Thank you. Thanks.